It's now my pleasure to introduce um, Laura Perez, who's Associate Professor of the Department of Ethnic Studies um, and a core faculty member in the doctoral program in performance uh, studies. And she's also an affiliated faculty with the Department of Women's Gender and Women's Studies and the Center for Latin American Studies. Laura Perez is the author of Chicana Art, The Politics of Spiritual and Aesthetic Alterities, um, which was published by Duke University Press. She has also co-curated uh, a number of exhibits, and um, her research interests focus on, um, and she has also published in the areas of post-60s U.S. Latino uh, literary, visual, and performance arts, uh, U.S. women of color, um, feminist and queer thought, and uh, art and spirituality, racialization and the cultural politics and economics of the art world, um, as well as um, cultural studies and, and post-colonial studies. Um, so I'm happy to uh, welcome her, and she will... Um, introduce our guest speaker. Thank you. Welcome all of you, and especially to welcome our guest speaker, Professor Linda Martin Alkoff. Um, Professor Alkoff uh, is a Latina feminist philosopher. She holds all of her degrees in philosophy. Um, her PhD was uh, was obtained um, or earned, as we always like to say, um, at Brown University. Uh, she holds her BA and her MA in philosophy from Georgia State University. Uh, she is um, a specialist in um, 19th and 20th century continental philosophy. Uh, she is also um, an expert in the areas of Latin America, Latin American and US Latina and Latino philosophy. Uh, post-colonial philosophy, feminist theory, uh, critical race theory. Um, she has uh, presented her work and published extensively um, beginning in the 1980s and throughout the 90s and up until the very present. And I'd like to take just a few minutes to give you an idea of some of her work and give you a little bit more uh, details. Uh, her um, her first book was Real Knowing, New Versions of Coherence Epistemology. Uh, that book is now newly revised and uh, republished. Um, uh, her second book, Visible Identities, Race, Gender, and Self, was published by Oxford University Press. It received uh, two prestigious awards, one from the Caribbean Philosophical Associations, uh, and that was the Franz Fanon Prize. Uh, and she also received uh, in 2009 for that book the award for contributions to phenomenology and philosophy. Uh, in addition to these two works, she is presently um, uh, engaged in um, a volume called The Politics of Love, which is co-edited with uh, John Caputo and will be published by Indiana University Press. In addition to these things, she has uh, 10 uh, co-edited volumes, and I think that by uh, reading um, some of those titles, you'll get an idea of the range of her very, very productive and uh, intellectually vibrant uh, life. Um, the first anthology that she co-edited was Feminist Epistemologies. Um, the second, Epistemology, The Big Question, uh, Thinking from the Underside of History, Enrique Dussel's uh, Philosophy of Liberation. Another volume was uh, Identities, Race, Class, Gender, and Nationality. Uh, another volume was Singing in the Fire, Stories of Women in Philosophy. Um, the Blackwell Guide to Feminist Philosophy. Uh, another volume was Identity, Politics Reconsidered. Um, in 2009, St. Paul Among the Philosophers. Um, and then after that, Constructing the Nation, a Race and Nationalism Reader, and uh, Feminism, Sexuality, and the Return of Religion. She serves on um, uh, 10 or 11 editorial boards, including that of Hypatia, the uh, Journal of Feminist Philosophy. Uh, she is also the president of the Eastern Division of the um, American Philosophical Association. Um, to give you an idea of some of the work, she presents extensively her work throughout the country and also internationally. Uh, 
to give you an idea of some of the things that she's actually been publishing very, very recently uh, in these last few years, uh, one of those essays is called An Epistemology for the Next Revolution that appears in a volume called Transmodernity, uh, the Journal of Peripheral Cultural Productions of the Luso-Hispanic World. Uh, then there's also Philosophy, the Conquest, and the Meaning of Modernity, which is forthcoming, uh, or perhaps was published already in Human Architecture. I didn't double-check that. And then in the Journal of Speculative Philosophy, Feminism, Then and Now, um, in Transmodernity, uh, Enrique Dussel's Transmodernism, and in the Review Journal of Political Philosophy, Is There an After of Identity? Um, she has numerous chapters as well in um, anthologies. And one of the things that's so striking about looking at her CV is, is the amount of the, the number of essays that have been translated into other languages and that have been reprinted and that are appearing in uh, a, a broad number of um, anthologies and journals, even outside of the field of philosophy itself. Um, I'm going to end with uh, just listing some of her works in progress at the moment. A book project called Rape After Foucault, a book project called Political Epistemology, a book project called Getting Over, Getting Over, The Future of Whiteness, and um, a set, two chapters uh, in an anthology by the Hunter College Women's Studies Collective, um, and that volume is called Women's Realities, Women's Choices. She's also working on an essay on Latina feminisms, on Edward Said's decolonized humanism, and uh, on Dussel's transmodernity. Um, it's extremely long, but we're here to listen to uh, Professor Alkoff, and so I'm really happy to welcome her here. You know, some people ask me, why did so many anthologies? Because it's not always a smart career move, you, you know, untenured folks to do a lot of anthologies, they don't count. But when you're trying to change a discipline, you know, you want the work to get out there in accessible form. So that's why um, we've done a lot of anthologies. Um, I'm really happy to be here because um, there's so many people in this department and this university who have influenced my work and who I've learned so much from, including Evelyn and Laura. Um, and this talk I'm going to give is mostly done, but not entirely. So I'm still thinking through some of the issues, and I think this would be an incredible audience to get some feedback from. So I really want totally honest feedback, you know, um, when this is done. So uh, I think, are there any seats left? I hate to see people having to stand. Yeah, there's a seat over there. Yeah. I know people don't like to sit up front because, you know, then you may have to get up and leave if you have something to go to. Don't worry about it. I don't care. Do what you have to, get, do what you have, to do. So, um, feminist collectivity poses daunting challenges as Simone de Beauvoir talked about many decades ago, since women are dispersed across every community. There can't be unity because there's no unified experience or treatment or ideational representation across the diverse contexts. The idea of, of a collectivity based on female identity, it would be too abstract, too minimal to do effective political work, right? So a number of recent theorists have argued that the category woman itself is too problematic to retain its utility for a collective feminist praxis. Gender identity, many argue, is a prison house of coercive performances, rigid boundaries, and identitarian logics. The actual individual variability, and that's a variability that's physical and biological, as well as psychological and social, and the historical fluidity and open-endedness of gender um, is closed shut by patriarchal systems. So this defining of gender is what patriarchy is essentially about. So as a result, <coughs> feminist political practice has been defined in increasingly generic and oppositional terms of critique and resistance to identity itself 
or the negative or critical project of undoing gender, dismantling identities, and escaping cultural scripts. Well, that's what feminism means today in many places. One's gender has to be announced at Occupy Wall Street meetings, which I came to appreciate, actually, after trying to figure out what that was about. But um, And one can opt out of gender altogether with generic pronouns like they. Although feminist theory is, in truth, a hugely complex and contested discussion, when coming away from one of these political or academic spaces in the global north, one can get the impression that there's a uniformly accepted, theoretically correct position that defines feminism as the all-purpose resistance to identity. The ubiquity of this portrayal of feminism as resistance to gender has garnered little resistance of its own. So in the guise of producing an orientation to feminism that will avoid exclusions, that will allow variety and recognize fluidity, this generalized stance of resistance to gender identity has become a kind of new universal with little attempt at intersectional theorization. The question of this paper is whether this uniform take on gender resistance needs some decolonial work itself. If gender identities are in every case mediated by other vectors of identity, categories, and communities, changing their form, their degree of intensity, as well as their political effects, then we need to think through what the intersectional mediations of gender mean for our universal deconstructive politics. And I'm using deconstructive there in a loose sense. I'm not meaning the specific philosophical sense, just a loose sense. Gender identities, after all, are not merely elusive because of the elusiveness of substances, as philosophers would say, because we've mistakenly taken a social kind to be a natural kind, but because there's actual material diversity across contexts of gender formation. Whether our perceived gender identity is taken to place us on a pedestal or rendered us as the mule of the world, um, a revered and respected mother, or a mother held in open contempt, depends on mediations of intersecting systems of meaning and practice. So I'm going to suggest in this talk that the intersectional nature of identities may challenge universally imposed agendas, bringing difference finally to the center of feminist theory. But we must be prepared to understand that varied forms of identity, such as sexual, ethnic, racial, national, and religious, may operate differently than gender identities or gender ideologies. So it's not just that the content of the identity scripts vary across cultural contexts, but the manner of identity formation or subject formation. Before we assume that all social identities operate in the same way, we need to look and see whether, in fact, they do. The genealogy of gender may have significant differences from the genealogy of other forms of social identity. If gender cannot stand alone because its form is always the product of mediated processes, then we should reconsider whether we can theorize a universal response to gender, or a resistance to gender, or a solution to gender, while ignoring the hybrid nature of gender. Taking intersectionality seriously means that we cannot separate gender off from other social identities as having its own unique identitarian logic. So let me begin with the case of Anders Bering Breivik, whose attack, you may recall, on his fellow Norwegians in the summer of 2011 aimed at instigating a race-based civil war that could conceivably bring down the multiculturalist, pluralist policies of his government. He killed Norwegians, and he, by, by specifically targeting Norwegians, Breivik hoped to bring the cost of multiculturalism home, in effect, on the Liberal Labor Party youth, who he feared would chart the way for an even more pluralist future for Norway. Norway has moved from a nearly homogeneous ethnic 